Hello and a warm welcome to Invest Africa. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. On this week's edition of Invest Africa, we'll be delving into the topic of regional integration and cooperation in Africa. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll be getting insights into the various challenges and opportunities that exist on the continent. Inefficient cross-border customs procedures are costing the southern African region around $48 million per year. Now that's according to the African Development Bank. The trade barriers are not only dampening potential trade between African countries, but between Africa and the rest of the world. Let's check out this report. Africa's trade has continued to grow and inter-regional trade has more than doubled from 47 to 108 billion US dollars. Half of this trade occurs in the SADC region where South Africa continues to trade with its neighboring countries. And Africa's trade with the rest of the world has increased considerably, with imports and exports accounting close to a trillion US dollars. This resulted in an increase of Africa's global trade to 3.1% in 2011, from 2.5% posted in 2005. Yet, the regional integration agenda still remains a challenge. Africa still grapples with poor infrastructure, cumbersome procedures and tariffs, and an unpredictable power supply. Cross-border truck owner Friedel Kirsten knows the day-to-day -day frustrations that come with these inefficiencies. If we can have cooperation between all the different countries so that they can clear the documents um, uh, at, at the South African border post and that same clearance goes all the way through to the DRC, that you don't have to stop at every border post and have clearance there again. Some speed bumps on Africa's economic recovery include rehabilitation of the continent's roads. Many routes are unpaved or passed through areas that are affected by conflict. According to a recent study, a projected investment of 32 billion US dollars towards road networks could lead to a 250 billion US dollar trade increase over a period of 15 years. And areas that would most benefit are the landlocked countries. Absolutely critical, to particularly to the landlocked countries that uh, have uh, abundant uh, resources. So whether it be coal or copper or, or some of the other minerals, getting those uh, materials to port is critical. Given the price tag that comes with these capital outlays, strategic partnerships between the public and private sector can help fill the funding gap. We're just about to do the single biggest private sector PSP uh, participation investment ever on the continent, uh, which is the dig out of the Devon port. Because the dig out of the Devon port is not in the 300 million. And so there we're going to mobilize the private sector to invest in the port. Strengthening Africa's trade links against the backdrop of a good infrastructure is one way of connecting the continent and ensuring that we can start to embark on that single trip from Cape to Cairo. Now joining me in studio to give us their views on the regional integration and role of regional bodies on the continent is Dr. Lal White, Director for the Centre of Dynamic Markets at Gibbs. Also with us, Memory Dube, Senior Researcher for Economic Diplomacy Programme with the South African Institute for International Affairs. And Matthew Stone, the Managing Director at DNA Economics. Welcome to the show. If we could touch firstly on the tripartite free trade agreement, obviously we have seen much talk around this potential tie-up of the East African community, SADC and Kumesa. I see they first met in 2008 and subsequently met again in 2011. Mm. My first question is going to be, Lal, to you, is this more than just a talk shop? I'm very concerned about 2008 and the lapse until the next meeting in 2011. Well, that lapse, I'd be a little bit more concerned because this is a lapse that we've seen uh, for the last couple of decades in terms of regional integration. We see that there's a lot of, a lot of talk, a lot of political rhetoric around a regional integration on the African continent, much of which has never materialized into any type of tangible agreement of the movement of goods, services, people, and capital between African countries. Africa is largely disconnected from each other, or African countries are disconnected from each other. In terms of the, the tripartite agreement and what is, uh, what is really anticipated and what, is, what the ambitions behind this agreement are, it's all good and well on paper, but I look forward to actually seeing what takes place on the ground and, and as we heard from that report, uh, how these uh, tracks of goods and services manage to cross the borders uh, with, with relative ease. Memory, do you see any execution on the ground happening? Well, it's difficult to say because um, there's a lot of political drive behind this 
but then you also have to consider the fact that um, on their own as individual groupings, they haven't really made much progress in terms of regional integration. So in as much as they're saying that you know, there's this concerted effort to you know, drive this um, you know, tripartite free trade area and create this big um, free trade area that will you know, facilitate intra-African trade, there hasn't been an effort to solve the problems that the individual wrecks have um, experienced on their own before actually moving on to this new one. So I suppose it remains to be seen how it's going to pan out. Do we then accept, Matthew, that this is pie in the sky thinking? No, I think it's, it's very early days. I mean, the tripartite is the, you know, it's the new kid on the block, but it's But one it's not. They first met in 2008, then forgot to meet again yeah, until 2011. Three years in the space of global regional integration is a very short time. And we're dealing with a huge block. We're dealing with a block of you know, more than 30 countries across an entire continent. And it takes time to start aligning countries up and start considering what their interests are and start putting in the nuts and bolts of an agreement. And so, you know, as memories indicated, the, you know, the political will has been expressed. Um, three years to sign off on the politics is you know, not bad timing, uh, but it's going to take a lot longer before we start hammering in the, you know, the cornerstones, the nuts and bolts of a, of a trade agreement. And so, yeah, we're going to be you know, we're going to be talking about these things for many years to come. And of course, this free trade area is potentially going to link 600 million people, 26 countries. Is the, our biggest hope of integration on the continent? Well, rather, let me rephrase that. Does it vest? with the East African community, SADC and Comesa. Mm. Is that where we'd expect the lead to come from? Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I was, I was going to uh, give this question over to Matthew, but I suppose I could... I, I'm I'd happy for you to ask questions <laughs> no, but, on the desk. I no, like that very much. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I think this is our, our greatest hope in terms of, um, in terms of the, the, the political orientation of, um, the di of the dialogue that's taking place between these regional blocks. And as we know, the most... Uh, the most well-established uh, regional integration uh, body that, that exists at the moment is probably the East African community. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between Comesa, the EAC, the East African community, and SADC. So this does make sense. Um, and I think, just to reiterate really what you, what you mentioned right now, is this is the only viable option to make Africa relevant in the global context, in global markets. Individual African countries on their own are absolutely irrelevant. They have no weight. We have no weight. Um, we are irrelevant um, as individual countries. So we are aspiring to some form of eco economies of scale. And that's, and that's why this political will and what, what Matthew and Memory just spoke about right now uh, around this drive, and sure, it might take a little bit long, but uh, this political will is a good starting point and it is something that has to take place. Clearly so moving in the right direction. Now, I don't want to waste your question, so please yeah. put your question to Matthew. What so, Matthew, it? is this the right way to go? Are these the right regional blocks to, to engage in this? And what about ECOWAS and or one of those? Exactly. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess that the only regional blocks that we have some level of familiarity with um, mm -hmm. as SADC or in Southern Africa, uh, ECOWAS and West Africa just seems another yeah, a big leap and perhaps a yeah, step too, too far. far eh? yeah. mm -hmm. So, no, I, I think if we... If, if we if we are looking to build a, you know, a continent-wide al alliance, it's, you know, it's best to start with those regions which are similar to us, are dealing with the same kinds of issues, and have similar kind of regional integration initiatives in place. And you know, SADC, Commerce, and EAC are you know, in, mm. in many ways dealing with the same kinds of challenges. Although I'd like to throw something else in here, and, and memory perhaps you can answer this. Leaving out the West African community, when you've got powerhouses like Ghana and Nigeria, uh, not to, to mention a couple of other territories in that space. Wouldn't that be a mistake from the outset? Shouldn't we really try and sit down and see right from the outset whether there can be synergy between East Africa, West Africa, SADC? I don't think it's a mistake at all because you have to start somewhere and you have to start small. You start big, you run the risk of you know getting this rather complicated mix of countries. You've also got language barriers. West Africa, it's, you know, they speak French. With Eastern and Southern Africa, it's mostly English-speaking countries. So you have to start somewhere. And once we've gotten it right within the tripartite free trade, free trade area, then we can move on to West Africa, North Africa, Central Africa. And you also have to bear in mind that um, 
in as much as we might question the pace at which this is moving, um, look at uh, blocks like the EU. It has taken them over 50 years to be where they are now. And now we're so not even sure whether the EU is the exactly. model that we should be using because <laughs> exactly. we're not sure whether exactly. they are sustainable. And there's been too much emphasis on the EU model for African regional economic integration. So maybe it's high time that we sort of find our own homegrown way of doing it. And this might just be the start. What is going to lead the way, Matthew, the free movement of capital or the free movement of goods in this East African block then? Um, and SADC, obviously. Getting agreement on the free trade in goods is going to be a great start. So I think in, you know, until that is in place, I think it's dangerous um, or, um, to even begin looking beyond a narrow goods agreement. Uh, you know, it took us years to get an agreement in place that covers goods in SADC. Um, we haven't got beyond that in SACU, our immediate neighbourhood. So I think that you know, just securing that agreement in itself is so a major challenge. So capital and people will follow? They might follow. They might. That doesn't sound very uh, hopeful. Yeah. Are you in agreement, Lyle? Um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned because at the moment, if you look at the intra-regional trade between these blocks, I suppose it's somewhere, Matthew, you could correct me, it's somewhere between 10 and 12 percent at best. So I think Comesa has got a, around 10 percent. Uh, that's in terms of a, their total trade with the world, uh, only 10 percent is intra-regional trade. Um, Absolutely. And if we close the infrastructure gap, we stand to double that intra-Africa trade? Well, the biggest problem though is that African countries historically and culturally are not accustomed to trading with each other and they weren't designed to do that. And I, I don't want to take the, the discussion back to the colonial times, but basically these, the infrastructure was designed to take stuff out. It wasn't designed to, or you know, it, wasn't, you know, it wasn't built to actually trade between the countries. And that is what has got to be rectified through, I don't know, through billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure development. But um, the whole idea of trading among ourselves is something that is almost a mindset change that has to, t that has to shift. And only when we do that and when our South African companies realize that the market does lie north of the, the Limpopo, then we'll realize the true potential. Because essentially you're talking about West Africa and essentially what you're talking about were the market opportunities in Nigeria. Nigeria and South Africa are the yin, the yin and yang of African development. That's the market, we are the capital. If we don't actually realize this, if we don't capitalize on this, it can't, it, the opportunities lie beyond just um, the regional integration that you're speaking of between Comesa, the EAC and SADC. It, it, it lies with South Africa's integration with the rest of the African continent. And Matthew, before you leave us, just a, a final word for, from your standpoint on the integration on the continent. Um, I, th I, think, I think it's an, an, an the barriers to inter-regional trade are necessary evil, uh, unnecessary evil. I think, you know, as Na um, Lyle's indicated, uh, ultimately for the region we need to be exporting globally. Um, we need to be worried about how we compete against the Chinas of the world in the international marketplace. We shouldn't be worried about competition from within the region and we should be doing all that we can to get rid of these unnecessary barriers um, to trade between South Africa and these generally small and generally uncompetitive markets um, that surround us. Goodbye to Matthew Stern, the Managing Director for DNA Economics. We're going to a quick commercial break and when we return, we zone in on the role of infrastructure in regional integration. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Invest Africa. From about the 19 or the 1890s, rather, the British Empire had a grand vision for a road that would stretch across the African continent from south to north and connect key cities along the way. Although the continent has made considerable strides in implementing this vision, Africans still face an array of challenges in realizing this dream. Whether it be road, rail, air or sea, it is important that African countries begin to connect and therefore realising their goal of a single market economy. Trans-African highways, or sometimes referred to as road corridors, are transcontinental road networks that are currently being developed with the aim of supporting trade. The total length of the nine highways is estimated to cover almost 57,000 kilometres. It is a link uh, largely that used to be there, has always been there, 
but underutilized. And so this signifies uh, through Southern Africa into Eastern Africa uh, the possibility that trade will increase and this is the backbone of trade that will take place between these countries. Other projects include the Beira Corridor, which is the link to Mozambique's interior and landlocked countries like the DRC and Malawi, the Ethiopian Djibouti Corridor and the Lobito Corridor. These are all aimed at closing the gap on the missing links. Eventually, over time, most of these links will be closed. But don't forget, even if you complete the, these links, they will also need, need maintenance. By the time you complete probably the unpaved links, you will have other links which are deteriorated to a stage where they need rehabilitation. An important question that arises is how long will Africa need to wait to see the completion of these infrastructures? The bank operates in cycles. The ADF operates in uh, cycles, uh, three-year cycles and depends on how much the bank can solicit financing from especially the non-regional member countries. At this point in time, of course, there are financial problems even in these countries. So the sourcing of financing uh, is not as easy. But uh, the bank has in the past uh, you know, achieved uh, soliciting uh, adequate financing for, for these projects. In order for Africa to reap the full benefits from the global trading system, the continent needs to continue on its path of integrating Africa. Dimisho Machanyele, Johannesburg. Still with me in studio, Memory Dube, Senior Researcher for Economic Diplomacy Program with the South African Institute for International Affairs. Dr. Lal White, the Director for the Center of Dynamic Markets at Gibbs. Also joining us for the second part of the show is Lolette Kritzinger van Niekak, Program Manager for Knowledge Management at Trademark SA. Thanks so much for your time again for the second half of the show. We're delving right in to this infrastructure uh, territory. And of course, Lal, this is a, a pet hobby on your side, isn't it? Right. Just looking at the map there in uh, the introduction, you can see heavily those links all being worked around the East African, Southern African development community yeah. rather than anything happening in West Africa. That's been the majority of our conversation to this point. Yeah, the you know, infrastructure just generally and infrastructure and the borders uh, across Africa despite this, this optimism and, and this excitement that you and I were talking about just before is... Don't um, dampen my optimism. <laughs> no, no, and, uh, we won't do that. But the infrastructure, and we must be realistic about this, and the borders are simply appalling. We are decades behind other regions across the globe. Mm -hmm. And something seriously has to be done to, to unlock the potential to, to release this bottleneck uh, that, that exists currently in Africa. Now let, let's get your thoughts on infrastructure integration. Are we nowhere? No, we have come a long way. Um, I would say, on the, for instance, the North-South Corridor, which is a, a backbone um, a corridor in Africa, about 8,500 kilometers, the distance between Beijing and Paris, we have made a lot of strides. I think there's about only 1,000 kilometers, which um, is really in a very bad state, which is uh, worked on right now. Um, another five um, thousand kilometers which um, are being uh, uh, um, rehabilitated it costs a lot of money distance um, is a major issue um, and um, I think right now they need about 1.8 billion pounds uh, just for the rehabilitation and of course the infrastructure itself is not a big issue but also um, the uh, divisions in Africa at border posts that is the major delay. And I go back to the stat, this infrastructure gap. If we close it, you referred to intra-Africa trade earlier, which sits at around 10, 11 percent. We can double intra-Africa trade if we close that infrastructure gap. And I think mm. Lolette brings up a very valuable point. It's all in the numbers. Where's that money going to come from? Well, um, a lot of the money for infrastructure development in Africa has um, of late been coming from China. But I think there's, well, as well as the traditional partners as well, but China has certainly emerged as one of the major players in the infrastructure development in Africa. But I think there's also a need to harness the private sector, both as a source of um, funding for infrastructure development and as well as um, in an active participant in trade policy, we need to work together with the private sector. Yeah. Is the private sector willing, given the risk associated with projects on the continent, Lao? Yeah, the, I see the private sector as being willing because um, 
big companies from Brazil, India, and China. You know, we hear so much about Vale, uh, active in northern parts of, of Mozambique, where there's, there's the Murtis coal, uh, coal deposits. There's uh, uh, iron ore in Guinea-Bissau. They, they are being, and along with a whole string of other mining companies and uh, construction companies, they are developing infrastructure in those areas. And I think what has to take place now is we have to orientate Africa into, toward a more enterprise-led development. Um, so develop those communities, develop the infrastructure around there, not only to service the mines and to, to extract the resources and to, to maybe take them off through, through facilitating ports, but to, to, to provide services and facilities for uh, the people and the communities that are there as well. And that's going to be a big, uh, a, big pro a big part of Africa's development. And to, do, and to develop this sophistication on the behalf of policymakers when they actually strike these deals with uh, the likes of India, China, and Brazil. Memory, in terms of the Chinese, you mentioned them, and, and again, Lal mentioning the Chinese. Is it a good or a bad thing? I mean, I don't want to go back to that old debate, but can we celebrate Chinese intervention on the infrastructure front on the continent? How we celebrate Chinese intervention um, on the infrastructure front on the um, continent depends on how we ourselves interact with the Chinese. We have to set the terms of engagement. And so far, it's mostly been us as Africa mostly giving way to what the donors would rather you know, invest in. I think it's high time that we sit down, sit down to find our own regional priorities as far as infra infrastructure and any other continental priorities are concerned. And then we set um, you know, the priorities. What do you believe, Lolette, is working when it comes to infrastructure? integration. What are the projects that stand out that we can draw from saying this is what we should replicate across the board? I, think I mean you spoke about the yeah, North-South Corridor. Yeah. I think um, away from from roads um, themselves but um, on uh, at border posts, the one-stop border post, the first in Africa at Shirundu, I think that is making a huge Shirundu. saving. Shirundu, one-stop border it's post. Between, uh, Zambia between, and Zimbabwe. Yeah, between Zambia and Zimbabwe. Between Zambia and Zimbabwe. And, uh, Zimbabwe. One of the m m uh, most congested border posts in this part of the world apart from Boat Bridge. And uh, the, um, with the upgrading and um, uh, rehabilitation of that border post, they've saved about um, three days f uh, per truck, which means uh, for every uh, load that it is uh, taking across the border. And um, it saves about $600,000 per day well, uh, for, tr for trucks going through uh, that particular border post. So if we can save um, it, not only at Chirundu, but also at Bidebridge, at uh, Kasumbalisa, at Nakamba. Well, everywhere in the country. Everywhere, Why can't then, we just go? Yeah, and then, there is a, the, yeah. I don't, and I, again, I don't want to be the one that dampens yeah. the story <laughs> because this is the, the whole purpose of the, these discussions is to talk about. Uh, this, this rising continent and but all the But also the challenges and being but realistic about the challenges. The, I've been through the one-stop border post at Chirundu and the problem is, and it's, I think it is fantastic because they've obviously got this massive x-ray machine and you, you drive your truck through and, there's, and it should uh, on paper be a one-stop border post. But there's also, like I said, or, or like we spoke about earlier on, is there's a mindset change that needs to take place, that mm -hmm. this is a one-stop border post, so it should only be one stop. Yes. And this is part of uh, a skills process or skills development process or education uh, for, for officials on the one-stop order post that says, well, we're only going to do it on the one side and not on the other side. Um, because they're going to be doing these one-stop order posts across the continent, at Kasumbuleza, which is between the, uh, Zambia and the DRC, at Bike Bridge, um, and all these other places. So this so project is well underway? Oh, it's, one, it's well underway, and they're rolling it out, and hopefully, again, in practice, it will work effectively. On the infrastructure front, we've spoken about roads. What about railway? What are, what are we seeing on that front? I think there is um, uh, some willingness uh, now and um, definitely the understanding that there is a huge revitalization of uh, railways um, is uh, a necessary. There are, of course, two schools. One mm. is railways are dead. Uh, uh, and uh, the other well, is let's quickly do a whip around here. Do you think that railways are I dead? I think they're essential, but given, given that the future of Africa still lies in resources. Memory, do, we, do you believe that railways are essential? Yes, they are. I, I think part of the problem is that there's too much emphasis maybe on infrastructure development, focusing on hard infrastructure rather than the soft infra infrastructure. So part of the problem might be that um, there are monopolies within the rail industry and therefore there isn't enough competition which makes them inefficient and you know, overpriced and therefore they're not being used enough. 
Mm. You need to finish your train of thought. I interrupted you. I just wanted to do <laughs> a quick survey to see which side we were on there. <laughs> now, I think it's hugely important that it is uh, revitalized. Um, uh, the monopolistic ways of doing business in the railways, that that should be addressed, that um, the track should be upgraded, that the rolling stock should be upgraded, and that uh, railways could pl uh, play its uh, rightful uh, a part, mm. especially on the commodities that uh, or transport transporting the commodities that Lyle have mentioned. Um, right now it's very slow, um, w one month um, for a turnaround um, uh, at, at, um, rail, um, or, and um, it is just much slower than, than road. It can't compete at the moment. We're going to have to leave it there. I think the soft inf infrastructure is another debate and worthy of an entire show, perhaps two or three shows, in fact. So we'll see you all again on the desk. Thank you so much for your time. We've come to the end of this week's edition of Invest Africa. We're back again same time next week. Until then, from me, Bronwyn Nielsen, and my guests, it's goodbye. <laughs>